So today we've got Kevin joining us, who's very active within the TensorFlow.js community and has a passion for super resolution, which we'll hear more about in just a moment. First though, Kevin, tell us more about your background. Yeah, um, well, first of all, thanks so much for having me on your show, Jason. Um, my background, uh, I've worked a number of different fields. Um, I spent some time working as a designer, and then I moved into doing front end uh, web development. Uh, I did a, a couple of years working as an ML engineer. Um, and I just, I, I kind of like bouncing back and forth between each discipline and also kind of finding the intersections of each one as well nice. is, uh, is, is, is pretty exciting. Um, uh, I also wrote a book on uh, using TensorFlow JS, getting started with uh, machine learning in the browser. Uh, it's pretty short, it's 100 pages, um, and uh, and you can get it online. Jolly good. A man of my own heart there. I certainly like bouncing around at various different locations as well. And you've been really busy. And of course, we're going to put that link to the description of the book um, in the description of the video afterwards. Uh, so do check that out. Now. What exactly is super resolution and uh, what did you make exactly? Super resolution is the process of taking an image and making it bigger. I think the, the best way, maybe the funniest way to think about it is uh, to think of those CSI shows where they all crowd around a monitor screen and they say, hey, zoom <laughs> in on that little detail there. Uh, uh, in a nutshell, that's what super resolution is trying to do. You're trying to take an image at a certain resolution uh, and get it as close to the original image as you can. Um, the tool that I built is, um, is an open source library that accomplishes that using JavaScript. So it's, um, it's a library for taking in images and running it through a neural net uh, that does the super resolution uh, and then uh, displaying it on the other side. Very cool. Literally bringing sci-fi right to us. Very, very interesting. So I think it's probably time to see a demo. Do you have one for us? I sure do. Uh, this is upscaler.ai. Uh, this is a website that has an implementation of Upscaler uh, running in your browser. And so what you can do here is upload an image by clicking that button or dragging and dropping. Um, you can also uh, click one of the images below um, yeah. if you want. So You can see there already this flower um, seems to be, you know, literally enhanced. You can see all the detail in the in the petal veins there and the uh, the pollen. If we just zoom out a bit here, because obviously it zoomed in at the end, you can see that effect magnified even more the before and after there, which is really beautiful, stunning stuff. And yeah, let's try some of the other images down below. Let's refresh this page and try again here. So we've got some pre-made ones. Let's try this, uh, this lady here. And again, you can see here very fast, uh, worked almost in real time. <laughs> and uh, but, you know, the details in the lines behind her face and the shadows on her you know, eyes and neck, you know, it's like night and day, really. So <laughs> really amazing stuff. I'm going to go ahead and fiddle with a few more just for good measure. And yeah, here you can see, uh, again, it's working really well here. The clarity in the hair and the details is much better than before. And if I, if I zoom out on this one, in fact, just to kind of uh, make it a more realistic size, the effect is magnified even more, but it's like, you know, completely different between the two there. And I know which one I would use on my website for sure. <laughs> Very good. Now, when I was using this tool, I noticed at the top here, we've got this drop down for GANs, 4X, um, Div 2K, 4X, and all this kind of other options. What's all that about? So the tool allows you to choose from a number of different models. Models can be trained on specific data sets. They can also uh, use different architectures. So you might want to choose a model that's faster, but less performant um, versus one that's beefier, but and is more accurate, but takes longer. Um, the other key thing there is that specific models are tied to scale. And so uh, depending on the size of the image that you want to produce, a 2x model is different than a 4x model. Uh, and so you need to decide that up front. And just out of curiosity, are the, um, the inputs fixed for these models or can you have variable sized images as inputs? Variable sized images. They can be any, any, uh, any Wonderful. format that you want. Oh, excellent. Or I say any, any size that you want, any aspect <laughs> yeah. ratio. Perfect. Um, so <clears throat> this um, like div 2K 4X, let's maybe try that and just see the difference between the two models maybe and just see how that goes. Sure. Cool. Um, so similar speeds, that's good. Both, both pretty fast, but you can see here, 
Um, this is definitely more of a painted kind of look than the other one, right? This is actually more like yeah. a painting. So maybe it's due to the training data that model is trained on and so on and so forth, as we discussed earlier. But, you know, it's good to play around with this and, and see which one works best for your uh, image types that you're using, I guess. So that's very interesting. Um, awesome. So why would one want to do this in TensorFlow.js instead of backend on the Python? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that there are a number of really compelling uh, reasons to do this in, in JavaScript. Uh, one is privacy. Being able to upscale an image right in the browser uh, where you don't have to upload the image to some random server and have your data out there, I think, is, a really, is really compelling. Um, another really, I think, compelling use case is around um, latency and not having to wait for the response from the server. Um, that said, I mean, sometimes uh, a server-based implementation of this technology might be faster, but particularly for users who might be on like slower connections or something like that, um, just being able to do it directly on, on the browser, I think, is, uh, is, is very compelling. The other, I think, really interesting use case that um, uh, was, was very compelling for me was the idea that you could save on bandwidth by um, sending these lower resolution images down uh, in the initial payload and then upscale them right on the client. Right, um, definitely. And especially if it's at lower sizes like 2x where some of that artifacting isn't quite as noticeable, I think um, yeah. that that's really compelling uh, from an infrastructure standpoint. And, um, definitely. You know. In fact, you just reminded me of a great case study we just launched with LinkedIn over on our blog on TensorFlow. They trained a machine learning model to understand the network performance and the mobile device that's requesting the certain images. And in real time, they'll replace the images of a high resolution or a low resolution one. But of course, as technology like this progresses, um, you could actually do that all in the browser as you're scrolling down to view the image. It would enhance it in that moment in potentially real time in the future. And you could actually do that instead, which would be very interesting for uh, larger companies who are dealing with like terabytes of, of image data going through the pipes every second, right? So that could save them a lot of bandwidth. Well, that's fascinating. One, one, of the, um, one of the things that kind of caught me off guard when I released this uh, library is that a lot of people asked for Node.js support, which is not something that it uh, supported out of the box. Um, and uh, and it, it took me kind of by surprise because a lot of the use cases I had in mind were around running it in the browser, and yet there was a lot of demand for it on the server. I think largely uh, to maintain that parity between client side code and server side code. I pushed out a, a, a release that added explicit node support. Um, and that's something I'm very interested in, in continuing to explore. Very cool, very nice. I look forward to seeing where that goes. And of course, in this case, you took a model that started life in Python, right? And then you retrained it and converted it to run in JS in the browser. Uh, maybe you can tell us a bit more about how your flow worked there. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I think uh, the first thing is to find an appropriate architecture, which is not as, e you know, so in Python, it's often uh, going and looking at the benchmarks and seeing what's number one. And, you know, that's the one we're going to use. Um, with this particular use case, performance is not num or I should say, um, performance of the uh, of the upscaled image is not necessarily number one. It's also how fast does it run? Um, and so uh, so I, I think the, the first step is finding architectures that are um, th that take that into consideration. So I, I uh, ended up using this architecture called ESR GAN. Um, yeah. And I found a very uh, good implementation of it that was written in Python written in Keras. Um, and so I was able to uh, port that over to the JavaScript. Uh, some of, I used the TensorFlow.js converter to do that. Um, it's quantized very heavily. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I I did some uh, specific training. So, uh, some of the mo some of the pre-trained models that the live that the original Python implementation offered uh, were focused on a backend implementation. So they expected that they had some beefy hardware. Um, I, I was see. able to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, shrink some of the architectures, um, which did Im does impact performance, um, but uh, you know it's sort of a trade-off. And so, um, okay, yeah. 
And no, did you do so, that shrinking so I, manually yourself or is that something you could do with the converter or, or how did that happen? That's uh, no, that's something that uh, that I did myself. Um, OK, cool. because th yeah. that that's a matter of um, changing the actual architecture of the model. So, for instance, how many layers sure. deep does it go? Right, right. That makes sense. Um, yeah. And the other thing that I'm very interested in exploring is weight pruning, um, which I, I know there's there's very good support for that in TensorFlow. Um, and that's that's something um, uh, that I think could add some, you know, uh, some big speed as weight pruning is sort is, uh, finding, uh, neurons that are, you know, sort of underperforming and just kind of snipping them, just getting rid of them. Yeah. Of course, yeah. that's going to help with the model file size to get it delivered to the client side as fast as possible as well. Then, exactly. Always, right. Very useful. Right. And, <laughs> and speed up how fast it's processing those images. Exactly. All, all of the above. So <laughs> it's a win-win for everything. <laughs> Jolly good. Cool. Well, now seeing is believing. So do you have any links for our viewers to try this for themselves or read more to go into more details? Absolutely. So um, I recommend uh, viewers get started on that uh, site, Upscaler AI, the demo. Um, from there, you can check out the repository itself if you are um, technically minded and want to play with the code yourself. Um, there is a link in the top right of Upscaler AI that will take you right to the GitHub repo. Um, on there are a number of examples. Uh, that will run code right in your browser and you can edit it and see how it's working. Uh, and that's a really great way to get started with a tool. If you're interested in even more, I have a great blog post that I'll, I'll, share, uh, I'll share with you uh, that goes uh, deep into depth about how I developed this and some of the, you know, some of the challenges I ran into. Yeah, I'm sure people would love to read that. And we'll put all those links in the description after the show, of course. And, you know, I love it when folk like yourselves produce these libraries like upscaler.js, um, which everyone can use, right? So it's really, really beneficial for all. So uh, maybe I'm going to try an image that is never seen before, uh, one of me wing walking. Let's see how that goes. So let's upload myself here. And uh, you can see it processing there. And boom, here we go. So now it seems it's kind of created a almost painting like effect. If I zoom out a bit, it's like uh, a little bit better, I believe. So here you can see it's definitely more sharper and it's definitely an image I'd prefer to use over the original. But of course, when we zoom in, we can see kind of almost the inner workings of the model to some degree of what's going on there. Can you explain that a bit for, to us? What's going on? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, what you describe is, as a painterly effect is, um, yeah. It, it, it's definitely something that these models, a, a lot of these models do. And it, it gets, it's, it's largely because uh, the models are, uh, you know, they're not recovering pixels that were somehow missing from the image. They're actually generating brand new pixels. There's a few ways to improve that. Um, one is uh, bigger models. Um, so just, you know, more performant beefier models, but those will take longer to run in your browser. Um, uh, another way to improve that is uh, potentially different architectures. Um, so for instance, uh, using um, one of the interesting, I think, areas of research is using uh, the features that the image, image um, uh, produces that a network that like VGG might uh, identify as input uh, to the training. Um, and then a third one might be training on specific data sets. Um, so oh. for instance, training a model specifically on art or illustration, uh, or in your case, maybe training a data set on, in, you know, a data set of JSONs uh, might <laughs> get you really good yeah. performance. Um, Interesting. So yeah, that makes sense. You want to kind of customize those models to be targeting the types of data you're going to be working with in the real world to have the best absolutely. performance. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Now I'm curious, what's next in your TensorFlow.js adventures? Uh, maybe if there's like one library you could make that you've not yet made, what do you think would be a good fit for the future? That's a yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think I've been so heads down with this, with trying to get this library out out the door. Um, I'm part of me is interested in just kind of going back and and be and you know adopting beginner's mind again and seeing, you know. One of the one of the fun things and also frustrating things about this field is how fast it changes. And so, yes, <laughs> you know, even I think in the year or two since I started working on this, so many so much new stuff has come out. Um, and so just taking a taking a breath and, you know, learning some of the new things that have come out is really exciting. Uh, but more more specifically, I'm always interested in the intersection of things. So the intersection of design and AI, the intersection of art and AI. 
Um, I'm a musician, so I'm really interested in how we can connect AI to music. Um, oh, very cool. Yeah. So something there. I'm not sure exactly what, but I'm going to see where, see where the curiosity goes. Yeah, we have magenta.js, which is powered by TensorFlow.js behind the scenes, actually, for more uh, creative applications of AI, such as music generation and all this good stuff. And um, yeah, for those of you who are watching right now, you might want to check out the tone transfer demo for magenta.js as well, which allows you to convert your voice into a musical instrument of your choice, which is pretty cool. That's live on their website somewhere as a demo. So many uh, great things can happen when you put your mind to it. <laughs> um, awesome. Uh, well, thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, of course, if anyone's got comments for Kevin, do leave them in the video after the show. And thank you for being on the show, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a blast.